probably could take us into another direction, talking about philosophy and evil and good and where does it come from. But I'm not sure that that that's something I, I want to address today, even though I think that would be a, a really fascinating uh, conversation. And I'd like to hold on to that, you know, in the future. Sure, but I, I would like to say one thing since you brought it up. Okay. And I'm here to tell you that, that what government does is it enables the, those darkest parts of humanity to become manifest and real and physical and visited upon both innocents and guilty alike. It seems that that's the history that it has. I mean, that is really the baggage right there. There's a lot of it. And, uh, you know, coming to, you know, belief or having a moral compass, and I don't necessarily think you need to be of any particular belief uh, or religion or a club or whatever to have a moral compass. I think that you need to learn a moral compass. I don't think that children are naturally born with that, but I think that they're I think they're naturally good. I suppose that's a whole other conversation. And I want to push forward and focus more on your book, too, and these the three pillars as well. So why don't we start with the, the pillars, self-ownership. So yeah. describe that and how that flecks each individual. And in our society and the way things are now, how do we recapture that or even capture that? Well, I think what, what self-ownership is, very, it's very self-evident what self-ownership is, and that's the fact that Bill and Liza should be able to do as they wish as long as they don't harm others, and whatever they're forced to do, they can only be compelled to do that if they decide to do so through their own consent. For instance, I, I think what's wrong with the left and right today, Republicans, Democrats, Greens, even Libertarians, because... Libertarians, a lot of them tend to be minarchists, which is limited government folks. What mm-hmm. they're actually stipulating is, is they're saying that my neighbor is my property. Yes. <laughs> That's what they're saying because what it, what it is is that let's suppose there's a 30% marginal tax rate. What that means on uh, as a um, as a more minor demonstration project of that is that Bill comes to Liza's house at the end of every month, and I say. Liza, I need 30% of your stuff. And you say, but I, I don't want to give you 30% of my stuff. And that's when I take out my gun and I screw it in your face and I say, Liza, you want this to go the hard way or the easy way? <laughs> and I'll take 30%. I'll just go through the house and take what I wish. As a matter of fact, I'll probably take 35% because I want to put a penalty on it for your noncompliance, for your bad attitude. That's the consideration of your neighbor is your property because when somebody votes for a local tax increase for their school, that's mm-hmm. basically what they're saying. They're saying, let's say it's five percentage points. They're saying that the next time the government, via the police, the tax authorities, whoever, comes into your house to take your stuff, we want them to take five percent more. What, what, what gives you that right? What gives you that authority? That authority rests on violence. That's where that authority comes from. It's might is right, and it rests on initiated force. I agree. I agree with your conclusion. However, the argument could be made, and playing devil's advocate here, certainly that you know we have a shared interest. You know, we we want educated children so that they don't become uh, scoundrels, so that they get you know they they can continue on enlightened doors open opportunities. They're the ones who will be taking care of us when we get old. Uh, we want them to be smart. <laughs> we want them to be conscientious. And you're saying that the government can do a better job of that than private consenting people who do it through peaceful means. Well, I think that's the argument. I think that's the yeah. argument. And maybe I'm, I'm, I'm being um, a little cruel, Liza, by in, implying that that's what you're saying. But I think that's the argument you're trying to represent for the sake of argument. And that's the way people think. Yeah. They say, look, um, I'm, it, a friend of mine, Mark Stevens, runs a show here in Phoenix, and he says that what government is, it's the provision of goods and services at the point of a gun. Well, I understand that, but uh, I think I think what it is, it, it, it's fear that drives it. For instance, let's say, all right, all of a sudden everybody must be responsible for their 
you know, whatever it is they do. How do you address the bad behavior of centuries where now you have, you know, families that uh, have no discipline, are having more and more children, not disciplining their children, not taking responsibility for their actions, and, you know, in order to survive, shelter, warmth, food, find that they have no skill. Uh, so, so the only thing that they, you know, they, they immediately go into survival mode, which means that you now are a victim. This is where the idea of where government comes in and protects you from the likes of that individual. And, and you're, you're right. And, and let me, um, let me make this one notion clear. I am not a utopian. I'm a dystopian because here's what I know is that when human beings are left to their own devices, they will fail. They will succeed spectacularly. They will be injured and they could possibly die via Darwin awards or whatever the case may be, you know, for, because of their own mischief or miscalculation or bad judgment because Freedom is dangerous. Slavery can be rather peaceful, but I would submit to you, Thomas Jefferson said that, and I'm paraphrasing. What Thomas Jefferson missed out on, though, is he said, slavery is peaceful. If you talk to most of the slaves who existed in the uh, the 16th or the 19th century in the United States, they would tell you it wasn't such a peaceful existence. Mm -hmm. They would also tell you today that they, we we do have these government schools and such, I see what's coming out of these government schools. I also see the teachers that teach at these government schools. I see what the curricula are, and that's why we've homeschooled all of our children, because we're scared to death to send them into these government re-education camps where they will learn all the wrong lessons. Mm -hmm. They will be dissuaded from practicing critical thinking. They will be encouraged to uh, play, let's say, electronic games or be electronically tethered instead of reading books. As a matter of fact, a good social experiment for yourself and all of your audiences, the next time you get a chance, whether it's kindergarten through 12th grade, go to the library at, at your, uh, your local government school and look at what the offerings are. Either look at the spines of the books or look at the fact that books are becoming less populous compared to the number of audio and video offerings that they have available there. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I can confirm that. I'm a big that. critic of the government school system. Yeah. Well, but, you know, we have this, We, you know, I guess it's the transition, you know, nobody knows how to make that transition. And, and just like with this quantitative easing, uh, it's kicking the can down another generation. And it's going to be so much worse when it finally comes to fruition. So, so I think what some people are thinking is, well, how do I get out of that? I mean, where do I go? How can I avoid that and, and start or participate in something that is a genuine, uh, that is more to my philosophy, that's more to my way of thinking, and nurture that as opposed to just, in, in, uh, you know, offhandedly nurturing, you know, this this <laughs> this really making this mess bigger. Sure, I think um, unfortunately here's where we are. What America is doing economically, and I would say that the entire planet is in this situation, is unprecedented in that the the economic catastrophe and collapse that you were speaking to, that they're, they keep kicking down the road, is going to be mm -hmm. even more spectacularly catastrophic because of the kicking the can down the road. This collapse isn't a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yeah. That collapse will usher in an opportunity for the nation to collapse entirely. I suspect that we're going to experience something like what was experienced by the USSR between 1989 and 1991 yeah. when 15 nation states were calved off of the uh, the underbelly of, of Russia at the time, and they went on to become their own nation states. Now, are these terrific places to live? Not all of them. Are there is there warring and violence going on there? Certainly there is. But... Uh, it's it's part of the growing process. I agree with that, but I, I guess well, I'm looking at it more immediate. You know, um, you see this coming. There are more and more people see 
this coming. They know it's coming, whether it's their consciousness that's driving it to, to that point, whatever whatever is pushing us in that direction, whether it's our doing or whether it's just our thinking, where can people go to, you know, to find and work with like minds to um, weather that? Well, Liza, you're, do- you're doing it right where you are. I mean, you're involved in community radio. You're you're involved in community outreach, and I'll bet that you're able to uh, you know tipple adult beverages with people who think the way you do. You can get together with with friends and family, and you guys can put together your own preparation plans. Like I always say, people say, Bill, what do I need to do to to get ready for this inevitable collapse? And and I hate to sound like I'm I'm foreshadowing a um, an event that's going to be you know, put us into the dark ages. I really don't think it's going to be that way. But I, I advocate G3 and critical thinking, gold, guns, and groceries. You know, <laughs> you, have to, you have to prepare with that. And, and critical thinking, where it's what you and I have been doing for almost the past hour, and, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm certain that you do on your own time and I do on my own time with my circle of friends, where we're constantly conducting Socratic drilling on why we think the way we do so we can improve our worldviews, our perspectives, and make sure that we have an accurate picture of what's going on instead of this kind of zombified somnambulance that animates so much of the American populace where it's the next football game, it's the next adult beverage, it's the next uh, issue of People magazine or what Hollywood star is stooping who, that that, that kind of um, banality, that kind of living through celebrity you know, watching yeah. sporting events, stuff like that, to me, that's not real living. Now, of course, you will have members of your audience who will contest that and say, well, I, I really like sports, and that is what I like. And maybe they have a whole room devoted to a particular sports team with the jerseys <laughs> well, and trophies and pictures. And, and you know, that's good yeah. for you, but it's not good for me. That's that's just kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Green Bay Packers are very, very, very popular. They're like family members, I think. I guess what I'm getting at here, at least in talking about the immediate future, it just, I don't know, maybe it just feels this way because this is the news or what I focus on and that this, you know, this collapse uh, is, is coming quicker and quicker and quicker. I just feel like we're moving closer and closer and closer to it. It's going to happen, and when it happens, it's going to it's going to be devastating. You know, it's going to happen Look, it's going all to be at once. Like, it's going to be like nothing we have ever experienced before because in the 1930s with the Great Depression, the other depression, not this one, yeah. people were much closer to their food. Uh, family farms were the norm, not the exception. Yeah. People knew how to fabricate things. They could actually sew their own clothing. They could possibly – they knew people who knew how to make sh- shoes or tan hides or do – all the things that fits into Maslow's hierarchy as far as all the things that we need to survive at a basic level. People don't have that today. I mean, look at city folk, Liza. City folk pride themselves on their lack of self-sufficiency. Yeah. They wear it as a badge of honor not to have anything in their refrigerator, don't you think? Well, it, you know, I mean, <laughs> just just talking to people, they don't know how to grow food. They don't know how to can. They don't know how to sew. They don't, they don't have the skills. And I, I try to tell at least the students that I come across, um, you know, get a skill. Learn how to do something. Make something with your hands. Don't just fill in, you know, the the circle to answer the question. Don't just I go and, 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 you know, read books. Read as many books as you can. Uh, read as many philosophies as you can. But you've got to do something with your hands. You've got to learn how well, to make something. I'll tell you what's really been scaring the starch out of me lately, Liza, is I've been doing a lot of research into electromagnetic pulse. Mm. And what the, and William Fortune did a book called One Second After, and there's probably a dozen fictional narrative accounts that are in novel form about what EMP would look like and what its electromagnetic pulse. And it, it can either uh, occur as a result of solar flare activity, like the 1859 Carrington event, or it can be a nuclear weapon that is detonated at a high altitude. Fortune in his book and a number of other authors of both fiction and nonfiction 
have postulated that if an EMP event occurs globally or just in the United States, at the end of one year, 95% of the population will have died off. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of people who believe that uh, that's, you know, that's in the works. That is something yeah. that to reduce the population, uh, it, it's it's almost beyond belief. At the same time, the fact that it's possible is is frightening. Well, you know, that I, I think we're going to end up going towards another <laughs> topic <laughs> in that direction. So I'm going to add that <laughs> to Perfect. something in the future because this could go on for a, a long time. And I, I, I'm trying to stay focused here. So let's let's hold on to that. But I, I do want to say uh, th- this idea of self ownership, which bridges us nicely into contracts, and that's not hard to understand. You know, my word is my bond. Yeah, and you know that that's the functioning, that's the building block of a voluntary society. Where let's suppose you're a teacher, and let's suppose I'm a consumer of teachers because I have children. You and I would enter into a contract, which I would say. For the next year, I'd like you to tutor three of my children for the following price. Mm -hmm. I will abide by the contract by paying you. You'll abide by providing me with a service. Mm -hmm. No one's put a gun to one of our heads, and both of us leave perfectly satisfied because hopefully we will have arrived at a price that satisfies both of us. And most likely, I won't give you a price that doesn't satisfy me because I'm paying you, and you won't be satisfied with a price that you accept when you offer your services to me unless you're happy. So... You know, that's one of the glories of capitalism in my mind is that there is no greater engine for innovation than the profit motive. Yeah. There's no other. Well, uh, you know, and there's a, there's a couple arguments there for that. I know that um, I've talked to even the most uh, hardcore socialists who say, you know, um, in this aspect, creating a market, you can create a market. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a profit market. Uh, you it know, has you have, to. It's impossible to do otherwise. Well, you know, it, but but I guess it's you know um, all all uh, the tideless all boats, um, as they say. There are a couple of different philosophies that I've come across. One is this philosophy where uh, the the rate of pay for the executive is within a certain margin of the worker, and as the the workers develop or make more product. And the you know the the prices go or the product sells and the prices go up that the workers share in that as well. And I think that's Marxist garbage and economic illiteracy. Ah, <laughs> okay. yeah, it, you know, there's an argument there. Well, um, Marx Marx has something that he calls a surplus labor theory of value, in which he says that if Lise is a carpenter and she sells chairs for a living, the only factors of input for that chair is Lise's. Hours made making the chair and the materials that go into making the chair. Yeah. On a very small scale, yes. On a larger scale, to deliver to more people, no. Because someone has to put a roof over the shop you work in. Somebody has to maintain the tools. Somebody has to purchase the tools. It's like Leonard Reed wrote this great book about eye pencil where he talked about how sophisticated a mechanism a pencil is and how global the enterprise is to build that pencil in all the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that goes into getting that pencil delivered to the consumer so they can put it in their hands, sharpen it, yeah. and come up with the best novel they can. Yeah. But you can't do that without a profit motive. And one another reason for that, Liza, is this. Who knows what's best for you, you or somebody else? Well, you know, the, the argument is that uh, which changes everything, which is ownership and getting rid of ownership. And that probably goes in a different direction than than you might be headed. But um that goes in complete ownership. as a matter of fact, the direction that goes in when you rob me of my self ownership and you rob me of ownership of private property and such, the direction that goes in is the five thousand years of government tyranny that has been visited upon the East and West in the past. That that's yeah. that's exactly where it goes. There's no other destination for it. When you take away private property and take away ownership. Yeah. Well, the argument for for or against capitalism is capitalism is this uh, hierarchy, and it is a straight line. The profits marginally go to those who are at the top or those who 
have bought in, you know, like with dividends and not for the actual labor that's being done. I'll, I'll agree with that when it comes to state capitalism, crony capitalism, Mussolini-style state corporatism, and all the other socialist, fascist isms where government is evol- involved in the creation of things. I think yeah. that is inevitable for those kind of disequilibriums to occur. But I'll tell you this, for instance, how can monopolies occur unless the government erects legal barriers to competition the firms that are able to purchase that kind of power. Yeah, we see that with the bailouts. Definitely see yes. that with the bailouts. If, if the government did not step in, all those banks would have gone under, they would have and been broken have. up, and uh, things would have been quite different. And they should have gone under. GM should have gone under. All these, all of these companies on Wall Street should have gone under because yeah. people say, well, too big to fail. There's no such thing as too big to fail. Especially in this sort of circles around nicely, thanks, Liza, to what <laughs> we first talked about, which yeah. is that even nation states are too big to fail. As a matter of fact, yeah. I think they're too big to succeed. <laughs> yeah, at this point, uh, it, it, yeah, well, my feeling is that the, the United States is too big to fail, and in that sense, it needs to fail. Uh, it, it, I agree. You know, and and it and I hate to even use that word fail. I I think it needs to be broken up. And this is brings me right to the uh, Buckminster Fuller quote, which is, "Don't try and heal a broken system. Create a new system that replaces it." And I How think funny, there's because a, I have seven Buckminster Fuller books in my library. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a, you, I have kind of, seven Buckminster Fuller books in my library. It's funny that you bring Fuller up. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a really profound and, and such a practical <laughs> quote. It is. That it, it and you know, there isn't anybody on the left or right who who, who doesn't like him. Uh, they might think he's a little quirky. I see that as one of the positive ideas in this idea of nullification or secession. Now, yeah. you you break off where you don't want the fences and the boundaries and the dotted lines or the, the geographical, you know, areas that define a state, you want no. a, a complete stateless. So yes. I can I can go anywhere in the world I want. I want to, if I want to live in the south of France or what was once known as. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. As long as, as I, and, and, but, but know that your, your life is in the hazard if you try to do harm to others. Right. Yeah. And because I think that, for instance, you know, we're, we're in this, this war on terror that's costing us trillions of dollars yeah. and robbing us of our, of our liberties and freedoms in an exponential fashion through um, these black prisons, through institutionalization of torture, through killing um, 16-year-old boys in foreign lands with robot killers, and all this other madness when, in essence, if you want to protect yourself from terrorism, number one, you don't make war on the world and piss off half of the entire planet where they want to seek revenge on you. But the other thing is, if, if, if there wasn't a cop on the street but everybody was armed, terrorists would have a very hard time after the first round leaves their gun because they wouldn't know who around them would cap them when they did that. Yeah. In the meantime, you know, in the interim, how uh, – I guess this is where I keep falling into – uh, developing um, this as a role model, you know, how how to set that up. And one can say, well, you can do it in your everyday life and how you live, which is almost impossible because you're, you, you know, you're, you're, you're shackled to the system unless you want to, you know, <laughs> live out in the wilderness, you know. <laughs> well, Liza, I, w- I would submit to you that you live every day of your life as an anarchist because when you're gathered with your friends and family, uh, let's say you go to a, you're, let's say you're playing soccer, or you like remote-controlled airplanes, or you're a modeler, or you go to a chess club, or whatever the case may be. When you show up at those events and you have a great time with your friends and family, you're not practicing nonviolence because you're afraid of jail time. You're practicing nonviolence because number one, you know that is a lubricant to good civilization, but number two, your own moral compass tells you what is right. Mm-hmm. You're doing the right thing, not because you're afraid of cops. You're doing the right thing because you know what it is. 
Well, I guess maybe I'm a little bit more militant than that in, in the way that I think because I don't think that I alone am doing enough in the sense that, you know, I can touch so many people, but there's so much, you know, there, there's this huge wave that, that rushes against us, which is our, our, you know, inability to communicate properly because the the communication is owned by these mega corporations which are supported by the government. So, you know, tearing that down, you know, having that in front makes it very difficult to communicate uh, in any kind of a, a broad scale, you know, to, to well, I, enlighten you know, minds. We, we have to stop concerning ourselves with, with broad scale communications and, and do what you seem to practice in your everyday life, which is the localism that you have. You've talked to me about your community radio, the fact mm-hmm. that you do these podcasts, and and the fact that you can go to people. And one thing I evangelize is I say, stop your cable and, and um, satellite subscriptions to television and turn it off. Uh, I don't have off. any, but yeah. I, mean, it, <laughs> I think it, most of the people it, I know don't have TVs anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, to, to me, as a for instance, and there's dozens of things or hundreds of things, Liza, that we can do, you know, to live this and, and to evangelize on this and to witness to peace and such. One of the things you can do that's so easy is, is say, hey, turn off the TV. Yeah. Try it for 30 days and watch how much time you find. It's amazing. It is. When I when I first turned off the television, and I've been without a television for a couple decades now, it, I was really surprised how much time and the amount of creativity I was able, you know, to achieve. Absolutely. Just, you know, stacks and stacks of art and and books upon books. And having that time was just wonderful. And uh, it, it, I don't think that people realize how much time they've wasted, you know, just sitting in front of the, we used to call it the idiot box. Uh <laughs> They don't, you know, and I, I do the same thing in my car where I listen to books on CD in my car or yeah. podcasts. I mean, the more technically um, savvy folks out there could put a podcast on their iPod or whatever the case may be and, and use that drive time to educate themselves. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I mean, in, just going through the archives, you know, again, here we're back to the Internet and just the, this plethora of information that's out there. Uh, stumbled across um, an interview with Mike Wallace and uh, uh, Huxley. You know, it, it was almost like he was just talking about right now. The podcast universe out there is is huge. There's a fellow in the anarchist movement by the name of Stefan Molyneux who runs yes, I know Building who Radio. What? Oh, okay, good, good. Well, I know who he, he is. Has, gosh, he has hundreds of podcasts out there. I mean, yeah. you could spend probably 30 solid days listening to his stuff. So the... Um, you know, the medium is out there for people to actually pull what they wish. And unfortunately, with television, it's a push medium where you really don't have many choices. And and and, and people I hear, and maybe somebody can, can, can verify this, that your brain activity actually diminishes, diminishes after a while watching the glass teeth. Yes, there are studies that show that, and it shows a, a whole different brain development that comes from children who, you know, from those who, you know, were brought up with radio to those brought up with television to those brought up in a digital uh, world. It, it's almost hard to comprehend how to put the brakes on all of this, and I don't know if that's really the, you know, the, the right way to go, maybe just to drive the car a little bit differently. Yeah, it <laughs> it's it's so huge and so overwhelming, and there's so many issues. Well, I I, for, I forbid electronic video games in my house for my children and myself. Yeah, well, and and, and that's a good parent, I think. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, although I I'm sure that uh, and I know <laughs> firsthand the argument I would get against that from parents sure. who would just look at me and their mouths would drop. What do you mean? That's bad. Well, the reason that, that the reason parents have to do that is the same reason that unschooling doesn't work, and the same reason that government schooling doesn't work. Yeah. What, what we're taught is that you have a, a group of 12th grade students, or sixth grade students, or first grade students, and they're spending so much of their lives being mentored by one adult, but they're surrounded by a horizontal band of an age group, and they're supposed to take on 
what that horizontal band does in a Lord of the Flies fashion, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to guide their behavior. The reason parents must guide their children's behavior is because we're adults. I mean, one of the biggest differences between children and adults is your ability to take responsibility for your own successes and failures. Yeah. And everybody's uh, successful. (laughs) Everybody gets an award (laughs) today. Yeah, and, you know, then we get into the whole parenting issue. So, you know, it's, uh, again, you know, we come to uh, the, the, the opportunity that we have with the access to the Internet and, this, you know, all these uh, ideas that are out there. And then we're up against, you know, this commercialization of everything that is this trap and keeps people in a certain you know, in, in, in a certain way of thinking and in in line. And I think that's, um, and that fear that if we don't do that or if the government doesn't do that or if corporations don't do that, if our culture doesn't do that, then we'll have complete chaos and mayhem. I, I, don't, I don't agree with that at all. For instance, you know, one thing I want is, is to see the reduction and elimination of all police forces. For instance, look at it this way. There are twice as many private security forces out there, what we like to make fun of as mall cops, as opposed to the statist cops. How many times have you seen police brutality videos with statist cops on YouTube? How many women have you seen savaged by cops on YouTube? Savaged by cops. There was a recent incident where uh, I think it was Kentucky or Pennsylvania one cop had raped seven inmate women. Oklahoma has one of the highest per capita rates of this because they have one of the highest per capita rates of female incarceration. Now, look at the converse. How many times do you see mall cops getting into trouble for brutality? When you say mall cops, you mean like at at the shopping mall? Exactly, and they're not state cops. They're hired by the mall. Yeah, security. Yeah, the, the reason why you'll find that it happens much less it, huh. it's it, they're not they're not hired on by the government number one but there's there's another key th- key thing here too they are bonded and insured mm-hmm. and they are civilly liable for their behavior so if they take a minute to savage and brutalize somebody they could spend the rest of their lives paying restitution to that person yeah. you'll notice there's an unlimited immunity for status cops at the local county state and federal level they can do anything they want and uh, let's say, Liza, in your city, burg, village, or county, a cop misbehaves and a civil suit ends up with a $20 million award to the victim. Mm-hmm. Who pays that $20 million award? Taxpayers. Taxpayers do, yeah. yeah. Don't you think that's a silly incentive process? <laughs> well, as a taxpayer, I do. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think. Yeah. Plus, I just think cops have too much control for so many reasons. I probably agree with almost everything is you you've said uh, f- philosophically nonviolence you know so responsibility without a huge collapse how do you wake people up oh i don't i don't think it'll happen as long as they're on a, a um as long as they're on a government welfare tube of one type or another when i say government welfare i'm not simply talking about people you know young families that get wick and people who get mm-hmm. welfare payments i'm talking about corporate welfare yeah. I'm talking about all these wealth transfers from Liza and Bill's pocket to somebody else, and the only reason that money's being transferred is because there's a gun against our heads that says, listen, you're going to sign off on this, you're going to pay your taxes, and not only that, we're going to make your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren pay for these present outlays even though they don't provide for a future investment. It's just shocking to me that with this um, new quantitative easing, with, by Ben Bernanke, where we're, we're, we're shelling out forty billion dollars a month to the banks to buy their toxic waste, and nobody's saying anything. Well, Ron, I'll tell you, you you had mentioned him earlier. Ron Paul's saying a lot. You know, you don't see him on the front page of Drudge or Huffington Post or anything. No, no. But you know what? The Ron Paul, Paul movement among the youth is huge. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody since the uh, since the America Firsters in the 1930s who has motivated so many people to think that minding their own business should become an imperative in life. That was the end of part two of my interview with Bill Bupert. Part three will broadcast next week. I also hope to invite him back with a list of follow-up questions. 
If you have questions for my guests, please send them to three words radio at gmail.com. In the meantime, our shows are broadcast at River West Radio and archived on YouTube at Three Words Radio and at Three Words Remember, these are your airwaves. Support and take good care. This is Eliza Brooks. Thank you for listening. That's all.